Um, well, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank Rob for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, I've always thought uh, Rob spoke enormous amounts of sense in his papers, and I'm uh, very happy to find out where that comes from. <laughs> now, I, I guess like many of the speakers, having been invited uh, to speak at this uh, symposium, uh, for which uh, huge thanks, um, having been invited and agreed to come, uh, one of the first things that I guess many of the speakers would have done would be to go and reread Baker and Stebbins. Um, and it's kind of instructive to do that uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that the book is entitled The Genetics of Colonizing Species. Um, but what you very quickly uh, pick up when you read it is actually there's not a huge amount of what we would really call genetics uh, in the book. Um, there's a lot of chapters in the book, but uh, they're very ably summarized at the end by Ernst Meyer um, in the final chapter. Um, and one of the things that Meyer says is, I'm sure every ecologist here realizes that he uh, really ought to know more about genetics. Um, and I have to say that that entirely applies to me. I know nothing about genetics, so there will be uh, a very minimal amount of genetics in this talk. The other thing that you kind of realize um, in a volume on the genetics of colonizing species is actually there's a bit of uncertainty about what they really mean by colonizing species as well. Um, and in fact, there's about three uh, sort of broad different types of uh, colonizing species that are uh, referenced in the volume. Uh, but the one that I will um, be dealing with in my talk uh, is actually the one that was the, the sort of the subject of most of the papers in the uh, symposium, uh, which is the, the species that sort of follow man or move into man-made habitats. Um, so what we, uh, what I would formally define as species that are not naturally present in the flora or fauna of a location, but have been moved um, to that location by uh, human actions, either deliberate or accidental. And a, and a good example would be. Um, the collared dove, for example, I took this photograph yesterday just outside my room. Um, it's not native to this part of the world, but it's very abundant here. So, sort of pursuing um, Mayer's summary, sort of milking it for all, um, all it's worth, uh, so Mayer sort of went through and uh, reviewed the talks and tried to identify from all the different speakers what um, had come out of the meeting as the special characteristics of successful colonizers. Uh, and there's sort of some broad themes that he picked out. Uh, sort of generalists or specialists with some special characteristic, um, and then a sort of a, a, an overview of what these characteristics are. But essentially what it seems to uh, me to be saying is that the success uh, in colonizing species seems to be primarily dependent on pre-adaptation. So successful species have some, have some sort of feature um, that allows them to be successful. Um, and Mayer also argued that establishment success depends on uh, native biota. Um, and biotic resistance, he, uh, he argued, was very important. Now, we've already heard um, from Spencer that um, many people argue that Charles Elton's book in 1958 is the start or the foundation uh, volume for uh, the study of uh, invasion biology. Uh, it's interesting going back to Elton's book. Um, Spencer said there's not much in the way of genetics in it. There's not much in the way of um, plants. There's actually... Um, really not much in the way of any sort of theory or hypotheses on anything. Uh, it's largely a set of case studies, uh, which is really interesting in itself. Um, for the 50th anniversary volume, I went through Elton and I sort of tried to pick out statements uh, that Elton had made about hypotheses for uh, biological invasions. And, and in the end, I sort of could only pick out from the entire book about five or six statements where he'd actually sort of suggested some hypothesis for what might be causing invasions. Uh, and these are all related to uh, biotic resistance, essentially. His argument was that sort of depauperate or disturbed um, faunas and floras were more um, successful. Uh, um, invasions are easier into those habitats. <laughs> um, and as Symboloff argued, um, and I would probably tend to agree with him, the real impetus, I think, for the growth of invasion bi biology did really come back to the, uh, the scope um, program. Um, in the 80s, and this program essentially set out to answer three questions about biological invasions. Uh, what factors determine whether a species becomes an invader or not? So what properties of the location determines whether it's, determines whether it's going to be invasible or not? Um, and then how should we apply management um, in the light of the answers to those two questions? And I would argue that although um, this volume or the, this program was really the impetus for invasion biology, actually there wasn't really much um, success in being able to draw uh, conclusions about biological invaders, probably for a, a couple of decades after it. Um, and I think, really, there were two reasons for that. 
Um, one is that initially there wasn't this understanding that invasion is a multi-stage process. So you don't simply go from being a native species to being an invasive alien. There's a series of steps you have to sort of go through sequentially to get to that point. So, you know, species have to be transported beyond their natural range limits. They then have to get out into the environment in the new location. They have to establish a viable population and they have to spread. And it's only if they pass through all of those stages successfully that they become um, an invader. And I think the second um, sort of development that really aided us um, to make some significant progress in invasion biology was actually the realization that um, whereas scope focused on the characteristics of species and the characteristics of locations, actually really the primary determinant of invasion success is neither of those. Um, and it's actually uh, really what people do that matters most. Uh, and really what people do best is to turn the process of invasion into a numbers game. And we can look at this um, in each stage of the uh, invasion pathway. Now, we tend to uh, treat transport uh, and introduction um, together because generally the first time we notice uh, an alien species is when it's out in the environment, so we tend to miss out that stage for it being transported and then um, being released. But if we look at that, what we tend to find is that it's the widespread, the abundant species that tend to be making it through these transport and introduction phases. So here we have uh, an analysis of uh, British bird species simply comparing those species that have been transported and introduced somewhere in the world versus those that hadn't. And what we see is that it's the, uh, the abundant species in the UK, the widespread species, that are more likely to be transported. People express preference for certain types of species. Uh, wildfowl tend to get moved a lot because they're very pretty and they're very tasty. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's always, or it tends to be the wildfowl species with the larger population sizes uh, that get moved to new locations. I have a student working on the pet bird trade um, in Taiwan. Uh, so she's been surveying uh, pet shops for uh, bird species for sale. Uh, her survey um, turned up 240 different species of bird uh, for sale in pet shops in Taiwan. Uh, and if you look at those, what you see is that um, the species that are for sale in pet shops have much larger geographic distributions uh, than those species around the world that are not for sale in Taiwanese pet shops. And that's true if you limit it to just um, the sort of non-native species. It's true if you control for taxonomy, uh, for region of origin. Um, so it's widespread, um, abundant species that uh, tend to make it um, through the, um, the transport stage. Uh, and for her data, we can also look at uh, species that are for sale in pet shops that have subs also have populations that have been recorded out in the Taiwanese environment. And what we see is that um, numbers for sale in shops really matters there. So the ones that are getting from the shops out into the environment are the species that are abundant in the shops. It's also likely that higher frequency uh, sort of phenotypes and genotypes within species are more likely to be moved because of this sampling effect. Um, and what we can also uh, see is that as you're sort of sampling or moving larger and larger numbers of individuals, not only do you tend to move more species, but you also tend to move more individuals uh, within those given species as well. So you tend to have more individuals moving through the process. And that affects the next stage, which is establishment. So once a species gets out into the environment, uh, what is it that determines whether it establishes a population or not? And the key element of this, or the key uh, feature of this, is the number of individuals that are actually released. So here we see some data for bird introductions uh, globally. Um, as you're probably realizing, most of my examples are actually uh, birds. Um, as Jennifer pointed out, uh, birds are by far the most interesting uh, taxonomic group, and <laughs> birders don't lose interest in their study after about five or six years. Um, anyway, what you see is that uh, species that are introduced in larger numbers um, are more likely to succeed. That's true worldwide. Some data for birds in New Zealand, the black bars, essentially show that most species that are introduced uh, are introduced in relatively small numbers, but most of the species that succeed are those that are introduced in larger numbers, the orange bars. We see it for given species. Uh, here we have data for house sparrow introductions around the world, uh, and when house sparrows are introduced in low numbers, the success rate is sort of pretty much 50-50, <coughs> but once you're introducing more than about 100 sparrows um, to a location, you're going to get sparrows. Um, it's not just true for birds, it's true for um, all sorts of other uh, taxa as well, and not just from observational studies, but exper experimental studies too. 
All of these show that establishment success is largely driven by the numbers that get out into the environment. So moving on to the last stage, uh, spread. So the evidence here we have suggests that sort of numbers act as a determinant of spread in two ways. Uh, so they act via the fecundity of the species that are getting out into the environment. So what we tend to see is that species with larger alien ranges or that have spread further um, tend to be those that have greater fecundity, greater reproductive potential. There's evidence from plants and birds for that. Um, but also we see an effect um, via the numbers of individuals introduced again. So the numbers getting out doesn't just affect establishment, it seems to have a knock-on effect that goes on through the, the spread stage. So species introduced in larger numbers tend to have larger alien ranges, and they also tend to spread more quickly uh, through the uh, exotic environment as well. So invasion success um, at all stages uh, is a numbers game. Um, so that leads us to the question as to why. And again, um, I think the answer to that question uh, differs at different stages of invasion. So if we return to the early stages again to transport and introduction, um, numbers seem largely um, likely to matter because of availability. So if you think about um, accidental translocation, so if you think about sort of organisms hoovered up into the ballast water of ships and then transported across the oceans and dumped on the, the other side, clearly you're more likely to be sampling uh, species that are more abundant in the environment or more widespread in the environment. So common species are simply more likely to get hoovered up um, because they're more likely to get hoovered up in, in greater numbers, they're more likely to have some individuals survive the journey, and then they're probably more likely to get out of um, captivity and into the environment at the other end. In terms of deliberate translocations, um, people tend to move what's readily caught um, or what's familiar, uh, and in both of those cases, it's going to be species that are, are sort of common in the environment, which we see for British birds, um, and even when you express a preference for certain types of species, it's still going to be the common ones that you're likely to get. In terms of establishment, um, probably different processes going on. And once a species gets out into the environment, um, it's probably going to face uh, many of the problems that apply to native species. And one of the main problems it's going to suffer from is uh, issues around small populations. And it's worth drawing attention to the fact that small tends to mean small for introduced uh, populations. So here I have, uh, for bird species, a simple comparison uh, between uh, the sizes of uh, introduced populations for just shy of 900 uh, introduced populations of bird around the world compared to the population sizes for bird species on the IUCN red list. So you can see that introduced populations tend to be small even relative to populations that we have serious concerns about their likelihood of persistence. So the issues that uh, apply to small populations in terms of conservation also apply to small populations in terms of establishment. And as everyone well knows, um, these problems include demographic stochasticity, environmental uh, variability, alley effects, and also uh, genetic stochasticity. And all of these will increase the, the likelihood that the small population will go extinct, <clears throat> even if its sort of mean growth rate would otherwise be positive. Now, despite the fact that people have um, sort of spent a lot of effort showing that propagule size or numbers released matters for establishment success, there's actually been rel relatively little uh, in the way of studies trying to uh, distinguish between sort of the, uh, the impacts of these different effects on uh, what causes establishment failure. Um, but we can start to look at that uh, through modeling. Um, and so one way we can go about this is to consider um, sort of different sort of how these different um, small population effects will affect the likelihood that a population um, will establish and variation in that likelihood. And so what we can start out by uh, thinking about is that a population will establish if just one individual in that population leaves a surviving lineage. And so we can model the probability of this, um, and it's very simply um, sort of the, essentially the, uh, depends on the difference between the, the death rate and the birth rate. Um, and, but then for the overall introduced population, it's clearly that's going to be modified by the number of individuals that are introduced. And so we can come up with an estimate of the, um, the probability of, uh, that a population establishes um, 
just under demographic stochasticity based on the probability that a single um, individual in that population leaves a surviving lineage. Then what we can do is we can add in um, effects um, or terms to uh, model alley effects and environmental variability. So we can include a, uh, an effect theta here to model the fact that um, you can have negative density dependence in populations, so the probability of establishment can vary um, at different num um, introduced population sizes. Um, and you can also model environmental variability simply by um, modeling um, differences in the probability that an individual lineage will establish um, at different locations um, across the introduced range. And then what you can do is you can compare the fit of those different models to um, real data. Uh, and here we have some data on um, establishment probability versus numbers of individuals in introduced. This is for a large sample of bird introductions. It's actually data from Danny Sol's paper in uh, Science from a couple of years ago. Uh, so these are sort of all the individual populations, whether they succeeded or failed. Um, and then th these points sort of represent the, the sort of average um, success rate um, at different numbers of individuals uh, introduced. Uh, and what you can see from this is that um, there are sort of two of the, the three models that we um, just described fit the, the data pretty well. Um, in fact, the best fit is um, the model that includes demographic stochasticity um, and environmental variability, but you can see that the model with alley effects is, um, is very, very similar um, in, its, um, in its fit to these data too. Uh, and there's a few things that you can draw from um, these model fits and these data. Um, the first thing to note is that although the model with alley effects fits very well, um, in fact, what you see is an inverse alley effect. So you actually see that the, um, sort of the relative likelihood of population success is lower for larger populations uh, than it is for smaller populations. Now, the absolute value of success is obviously higher for larger populations, uh, but the relative, uh, relatively that success is lower. In other words, the per lineage um, probability of, of success um, is lower for large populations. Uh, what you also see is that under the model of environmental variability, there's a sort of bimodal distribution of um, probabilities of establishment. So there's lots of areas that are very uh, bad for establishment, and there are some areas uh, that tend to be very good. And what you can essentially draw from this is that um, at low population sizes, uh, numbers matter, and that's uh, likely because of the effect of demographic stochasticity at very small population sizes. But beyond small numbers, the success really depends on whether the location that a species has been introduced to is a good location or a bad location. Um, and so species will tend to, um, <laughs> they'll tend to uh, fail uh, if the location is bad and they'll tend to succeed if the population is good. And obviously, um, this kind of leads to this inverse alley effect. So if a large population is introduced to a poor area, it's going to go extinct uh, regardless of the population size. And actually what it's possible to do is it's possible to partition um, this success into species or location effects, um, and you can actually show that, that both matter. So this effect could be because you've got some species that are bad at establishing um, versus some species that are good, um, and there is certainly an effect of that, but the, if you remove that effect, um, you still find uh, impact of location. Now, this doesn't really deal with uh, genetic stochasticity. Um, we know that if you have small numbers of individuals introduced, uh, you tend to have population bottlenecks, uh, lower genetic diversity. Uh, Katrina Duke's work showed that um, you can see a proportional decline in uh, genetic uh, variation in introduced populations relative to their native populations. Um, that decline depends on whether um, it's a single introduction or a multiple introduction. Multiple introductions tend to have lower declines in, in genetic diversity. Uh, but actually, uh, this doesn't tell us, and as far as I know, that's, there's nothing that does tell us uh, what the effect of this genetic sort of reduction in genetic diversity is on success. Uh, because as Mark pointed out, you what you actually need to do to understand success and failure at a given level, a given stage in the invasion process is to compare successes with failures. Um, and this data only uh, relates to successes. So we don't know what the genetic, uh, the change in genetic diversity for the failures uh, would have been in this particular case. So finally, moving on to uh, the spread stage. So numbers sort of matter in, in two ways for spread. Um, there's an impact of fecundity, and that seems likely to be because 
essentially you can think of spread as a sequence of um, establishment events. So once a population is established in a location, um, it spreads essentially by establishing new populations in new locations. So given that the numbers introduced matters for that first population, uh, you would also um, think that the numbers of individuals that are sort of getting into new locations would also matter there. Um, and presumably fecundity is going to be a major driver of that. So species that are putting out lots of individuals uh, into the environment and into new locations are probably more likely to establish and spread. But there's also this interesting effect of numbers introduced, which goes beyond the establishment phase and seems to affect um, how species spread. Now, it seems likely that demographic um, and environmental stochasticity and alley effects are all going to disappear quite quickly as the population grows. So it seems perhaps most likely um, that the impact of numbers introduced on spread is going to be acting through persistent genetic effects um, that are sort of lasting well beyond uh, the establishment phase. And so this may happen because of um, genetic effects are acting on um, fitness of the populations is introduced. Um, or possibly on their ability to adapt. So we know um, that we potentially see genetic effects on fitness in non-native populations. So here we have um, a set of alien uh, populations in, of, of birds introduced to New Zealand. Uh, and this graph simply pops um, the numbers introduced actually on a sort of reverse axis, just to be confusing. But the number introduced against um, the relative hatching failure of the species so this is the, the probability that, that eggs it lays will uh, fail to hatch um, in New Zealand, the introduced location versus the UK, the uh, native location. And what you can see is that um, populations introduced in smaller numbers um, have higher rates of hatching failure uh, in these introduced populations. And this is sort of well over a century um, after the populations are introduced. Um, but then, of course, genetic effects may also um, uh, act on adaptability, and because I'm not a geneticist, I'm not going to talk about this. Um, I'm merely going to make the point that um, what we often see in uh, introduced populations or established populations as they spread is that there is a sort of a lag phase, um, often followed in a sort of biphasic manner by a um, sort of a, a much greater rate of popul uh, population spread. So these are data from the starling um, invasion across uh, North America. Initially, starlings spread relatively slowly, but there was a point uh, at which they suddenly took off. Um, and so one idea is that this could potentially relate to uh, some uh, sort of event in the population, some sort of adaptation that arises that allows them uh, to spread very fast. Uh, and also there's the possibility that um, sort of the sampling effects, uh, species introduced in relatively low numbers, uh, perhaps um, don't have the necessary genotypes introduced to a, um, a population to allow um, that population uh, sort of to have the pre-adaptations essentially that uh, allow it to, to spread. So, I will just finish up by concluding that at all stages of the invasion, numbers matter. We tend to think about it mainly in terms of um, numbers really introduced affecting establishment, but uh, numbers also affect which species are getting transported, which species are getting introduced. It tends to be common and abundant species. Obviously, species tend to be common and um, widespread and abundant for a reason, um, so we're introducing those species into new environments. Um, but it also seems that the numbers uh, introduced the numbers put into the environment at the establishment phase also um, affect subsequent invasion spread. So I will just finish up by uh, thanking all my various uh, co-authors um, on this work. And um, if you want to know more about bird invasions, which I'm sure you will, uh, there's this really good book. Thank you very much. <laughs>